Hey, good afternoon, TEDx CERN. So what I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is talk to you about how chemistry is beginning to understand itself. Or maybe chemistry wants to try and make itself. So this big question about how are we going to understand complex matter is quite profound. So let's talk about how we can make a network of chemistry. So all molecules in nature are connected together. Simple molecules can be transformed into more complicated molecules. So we kind of have the basis of making a really complex chemistry kit. But just in the same way that the idea of the web came from CERN, how can we get the idea of networking that chemistry together in an intelligent way? And what can we use that for? So if you imagine that molecules are the cities, and the reactions take you down the road from one molecule to another, I want to see if we can get all of chemistry in a box, if we can navigate all those roads to get to all those cities and literally access all of chemical space. Now, why would we want to do that? What is the, the chemistry Apollo? And I guess it's quite apt being at CERN, because CERN has been on this wonderful, wonderful uh, road to try and discover the secrets of the universe. The Higgs boson was a big call to arms for physicists. What can be the, the call to arms for chemists and other scientists? And I would argue that working out where life came from and then trying to make life would be a similar kind of Higgs project, our Apollo project. But why is it important? Well, we know more about the origin of the universe than we do the origin of life. They have it easy. They can look back in time because by looking up. Now, of course, it's not easy, but at least they can look back in time. You can see the microwave background radiation and infer this, from this evidence how we got to the origin of the universe. But how do we get to the origin of life? How do we make life? And so this problem is quite profound, I think, and it's bigger than my research group and many other research groups out there, and we need to find a way as chemists and scientists to work together to look for this big, to solve this big problem. In the same way, the humankind looked up, I guess, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years and realized we were, we were standing on a planet. And just, you know, in a few, few years ago, we decided that we were going to go from Earth to the moon. And that's a great vision. It's quite easy. Look, look up in the sky. There's the moon. We're going to go there. How are we going to go there? We're going to build a rocket. We're going to get astronauts. We're going to go. And it's a vision that everyone could see. So how can we look and understand the chemistry Higgs, the origin of life. How can we make life? How can we get that vision working for us? And it's really like we've got to agree on what the problem is. And I would say that probably we want to be able to make, in our labs, a cell. And if I can show you a cell that I've made in my lab, that we've made in our collective labs, that we will be able to in, in kind of start that game when it comes to the vision. But how are we going to make life in the lab? This seems a, a totally unfathomable, unstartable problem, almost as big as the problem, how are we going to, to find the Higgs boson? So again, coming back to this big rallying call, trying to work out how we are going to realize this big quest is, is I think, one of the defining problems of our age. How are we going to create life in the lab? So, Let's think about the scale of the problem first. It's pretty simple. I, I often joke with the, the funders in the UK that I ask for money. You know, I don't need money anymore. Just give me a planet and a very long time. But obviously, I don't have a very long time or a planet, so we need to cut this up. We need to turn time into space, and we need to work out how we can engineer that. So we could chop it up. We could have an ocean. Can I have an ocean? Well, probably. I might be able to have a pond. Darwin thought maybe we could start with a pond. In my laboratory, we do a lot of chemistry, and I have a, a wonderful team of people, and we all work together to think about how we can do reactions in an ever more complicated way. But we need to go to the test tubes, but probably we need to get smaller, because we need to explore together a much bigger landscape, maybe to oil droplets or other types of cells. And what are we trying to do? Just so you're in no doubt, we are trying to make life like you see on the screen. Cells that grow when you feed them, that self-replicate. If we can do that in the lab from scratch together, then we will know once and for all that we are not an odd thing in the universe. By making life on the Earth, perversely, we'll know that we aren't alone. Why? Because we're going to use a search engine to compress a planet and a very long time into a laboratory timescale. 
And I wonder if that idea, that vision, that to get, try and get that technology together, that science together, will be a, a pretty compelling call to arms. But it is a question of scale. We've got, let's assume it took roughly 400 million years for life to emerge. That's a reasonable time scale, I guess. I don't know. I don't have a time machine, but let's start there. There's a lot of sea, so there's a lot of molecules in, in water. And there's, there's a fair amount of time. And then if you add that all together, we have quite a large number of events. So really what we want is a box in which we shake our molecules, and we can do 10 to the 53 shakes, and out will come life. As simple as that. Well, maybe not. We need to perhaps think about it in a, in a more engineering sense. So I wonder if we can together, like CERN, brought together particle physicists and theoreticians from around the world, big computing, big experiments, big unification, to try and attack this problem. And so what we've tried to do in my lab is to start to network chemistry. There's a very crude thing on the screen. I want to make, or rather we want to make, actually, a trillion reaction array. Now, we've only got four reactions, and you can see there's quite a lot of pipes and pumps. I'm not going to fit a trillion reactions into any simple space. And I really liken this problem to going back to the first transistor. The first transistor was gigantic. Once it was realized, we could probably figure out we could make a processor. So this is really it's just an engineering problem, I say. Well, OK, now we have to work out a way of getting around that engineering. How can we create this chemical internet? So what we've started to do in my lab, and others are starting to follow and, 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 and discuss together, is this idea of using cheap pro, uh, prototyping technologies to try and take flow chemistry um, into a, a new regime and use 3D printing to print the Lego of complexity, to basically print a bunch of reactors just like Lego. There's no analogy here. We will slot them together like Lego to make a trillion re reactor array. And so we will print these engines, we'll use computer design as we are at the moment to try and make these reactors, make them highly sophisticated, allow them to talk to one another. But in comes the next problem. We now need to make a world wide web. So we need to make a web of chemistry. We need to understand how the molecules can be networked together. And there are lots of existing databases and standards. And by bringing this together again in a big project, I would argue that it's part of the Apollo program of finding life or making life, we could, be, we could do this. It, the, the, the capability exists right now. And one thing we're doing, it's a very fun thing to try and play with, but we're using real 3D printers to make real reactors and use them also as cheap robots to do the chemistry. I'm not trying to replace the PhD student, but we are trying to get them out of the lab because if I say to the students, can we try and do a trillion reactions in the next maybe a month or two, they may want to, but it's quite hard. So how can we deploy this technology? It's rather like getting a, you know, getting a, a physicist from a few decades ago, giving them a bubble chamber, and say, go on, go find that Higgs. You know? And it's really, the analogy is really compelling, because it wouldn't be possible. But there was a roadmap to get there. And so once we've discovered how we can do lots of these reactions in real time, we'll be able to embed these networks uh, take the chemistry, do them in reality, but then reduce it to data. And then we have a big data to crunch. And so we can take a real chemical reaction array, get the data, and start to think about how we can decompile that. So then we reduce chemistry to data. But what are we looking for? It's OK me saying, right, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to make life. What are we looking for? The physicists had a very interesting set of models they wanted to test, and they had some predictive power. So we are all trying to work out what are we looking for, what are we predicting if we go and search. So if we're looking for a kind of inorganic cell, an artificial life form, we want to work out how we can make something that has a minimal nanomolecular library. What I really mean to say is that cells are basically um, uh, nanotechnology. There's lots of nanomachines, and they're doing stuff. But how did they get there? They weren't designed. They were put there by evolution. So we are trying to discover evolvable nanotechnology. It sounds kind of cool, put like that. But we need molecular replication. We need to have a membrane, because they need an identity. So all these things are assumptions we're going to test. In the same way, the particle physicists did experiments to try and investigate a theory. And we need to change the environment. 
And we need to kind of use that environmental changing to use evolution, because I think that the evolution is the key driving force in nature that makes matter come alive. But also, we have to feed it. If we can't feed it, and it can't be dissipative, then it's going to die relatively quickly or never even live. So to try and engineer this, we're making chemical engineering for the evolution of life at lots of big scales, big bell jar scale, test tube scale, and then at the micron scale. And by linking those together, we might be able to take the big vat into a smaller scale and smaller scale and compress this planet 400 million year problem to a series of laboratories or maybe a, maybe a lab as big as CERN. I don't know, but we may be able to solve the problem that way. But what do we expect to get? Well, what we're trying to do right now is engineer new types of cells, artificial cells, that will undergo the evolution, that will start to, to, to do things that we didn't expect that, that were here. here. Here you can see a, a droplet that's moving around. There's a metabolism in it. It's, it's kind of stressed out, as you can see. It's exploring its space, changing shape. And just by my, my students in my lab just found this in a few weeks by trying to deploy different competing chemistries. But that's not all. What we need to do is not only generate those, but enable other people to do it. We need to generate a new technology basis. So the reason why synthetic biology has taken off is there are high common standards and high throughput. How can we get chemists together to have common standards and high throughput? And I think that maybe one way we can do this together is to do 3D printing to make our Lego bricks to, have, to, make, to make high throughput chemical reactions occur. And it's a little bit easier than some of the technologies out there, because it has to be cheap and realizable. And what are we going to try and do? Well, what we're doing right now is we're creating the Trillion Reaction Array. I want to see a team of people somehow, sometime in my lifetime, build a machine that can do trillions upon trillions of reactions using evolution as a guiding force. And what might we see? Remember, proof of success is not a conjecture. The, the thing that was so powerful at CERN is that there was a theory, and they went and did an experiment. So we need to build that theory together as a community. How do we tease out this boundary between life and non-life? How does it work? We have the engineering. We bolt it together through big teams. We crunch big data. And then what we need to find at the end is we need to discover an object that looks like a bacterial cell. We need to make that step to see if we can find a cell that when we feed it, when, it does, um, when it's existing in its environment, that it will replicate. And if we can manage to do that on, a, on just a small scale and then use evolution to drive this, we may be able to take the first step to understanding if we really are alone in the universe. There it goes there. So this is a very simple droplet that, can, that, that spontaneously underwent fission. And the, there is an oscillating chemical reaction in these two droplets. And this just to show you, a simple search finds this type of complexity. So what can we do if we go out and search big time and have a big collaborative effort? We have common standards, common chemistry kits, and we use this kind of network but interpreted by the web that we're going to make to try to see if we can make life. Thank you very much.